Take it to the limit. That famous Eagles song from the 1970s became an important anthem for my crew team as we competed for a gold medal at the Henley Royal Regatta. Taking it to the limit was a rallying cry for college athletes competing on the world stage and became a foundation of how I wanted to lead my life. Taking it to the limit represents that character of people that sees them fully engaged, enthusiastic, and optimistic in daily interactions and in their outlook on the future. The famous and poetic words of unfettered optimism and unrestricted vision from that eagle song provides pleasant nostalgia for most of the old guard in the room, while likely being considered ancient history by the young future leaders of our specialty. Taking it to the limit is what cardiothoracic surgery has done for the past 50 years and what the Society of Thoracic Surgeons has done on behalf of the specialty for that same half century. Our founders took it to the limit when they had the courage and foresight to create a new specialty society, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, to represent a fledgling specialty and to become a home for that specialty within North America. Pioneering surgeons were taking it to the limit when they tried new procedures in thoracic and in cardiac surgery. They forged a new specialty that would impact millions of lives for the better. The presence of this society, volunteer leaders, and professional staff have been taking it to the limit to make our specialty the model of innovation, quality, and patient-centered care that it is, is an example and paradigm for other medical specialties. The foresight of leaders like Richard Clark and Fred Grover in developing our databases, and Mark Oringer for leading us to self-management are examples of our leaders taking it to the limit on behalf of cardiothoracic surgeons and their patients. Some of the things that made us successful in our first 50 years may not be as effective or may even be counterproductive in our next 50 years. If we are going to take it to the limit for the next five decades, we will need to continue to evolve as we have done in the past. Although this evolution will encompass areas which may not be appreciated today, I would like to highlight two themes that I think would be important for us and for our continued success. The first is to embrace a feminism in cardiothoracic surgery that is heretofore distinctly absent. Indeed, we are a macho specialty, frequently described as cowboys for our improbable fearlessness, brashness, and swagger. But in feminism, I am not talking about the bra-burning militant gender wars of the 1960s and 70s. Rather, I am referring to a feminism that recognizes that our future is dependent on the recruitment of brilliant and talented women into our specialty and promoting them into positions of leadership within our departments, our hospitals, and our specialty societies. And I do not intend to slight the men destined to be cardiothoracic surgeons. I'm one of them. I equally want to attract and encourage these smart, innovative and hard-driving men into our specialty, certainly the men before them have laid a good groundwork for our future. However, more than half of our medical school graduates are engaged and creative women, and without them we lose half of the intellectual talent that will keep our specialty fresh, relevant, and progressive. The other theme where I see us at a turning point, a place where we can take it to the limit, is a shift in style of leadership to selfless leadership. This leadership style is more effective, modern, and accepted by people in our professional lives and in our communities. Part of the macho swagger of cardiothoracic surgery has been transactional and selfish leadership focused on the leader's ego and the submissive performance of the rest of the team. In the rough and tumble early days of cardiac surgery, this highly ordered and prescriptive style was effective and led to the virile growth of our specialty. 
This leadership style was also a cultural norm emanating from the Depression and World War II era surgeons who dominated the, de the development and maturation of our specialty. However, this leadership and behavior style is also responsible for the widespread reputation of cardiothoracic surgeons as arrogant, condescending, and insufferable, a reputation, unfortunately, that we have not yet shaken. Although this leadership was effective for its time, expectations have changed, and the culture and people that we deal with today are radically different than those in our first half century. It turns out that these two areas of feminism and selfless leadership are closely intertwined. The traits of selfless leadership that are likely to be the most effective for our future are like, likewise those traits who are, that are feminine and more naturally attributed to women leaders. Today I would like to also celebrate and, and honor the inherent qualities of leadership present in those who choose to be cardiothoracic surgeons. Leadership that results in everyday heroism, leadership that extends beyond feats in the operating room, leadership of quiet colleagues who are heroes in their community for their country and dedicated to helping others. We are fortunate to have many amazing models of selfless leadership in our specialty and amongst our peers that we work beside each day. They are not necessarily the most famous, but if you think of those colleagues that you most admire, you are probably identifying a selfless leader. It is someone that you admire for their integrity, their humility, their generosity and altruism, rather than their technical or academic prowess. 100 years before the founding of STS, almost to the day, the British ship Grafton, led by Captain Thomas Musgrave, shipwrecked in a vicious storm on the southern portion of Auckland Island. Four months later, another ship, the Scottish square rigger Ingricald, captained by Dr. George Delgarno, wrecked in the northern portion of the same island. Auckland Island is a remote, God-forsaken place in the fierce expanse of ocean between New Zealand and Antarctica. Year-round freezing rain and howling wind and lack of adjacent shipping make Auckland Island one of the most remote and forbidding places on Earth. To be shipwrecked there meant almost certain death. Although only 20 miles apart, the two crews were unaware of each other's existence and yet with almost identical circumstances suffered diametrically opposing outcomes, highlighted beautifully in a book by the New Zealand maritime historian Joan Druitt entitled Island of the Lost. The crews endured relentless cold, wet, and windy weather with no shelter and negligible resources. However, Captain Musgrave inspired his crew who banded together in a common quest for survival. They salvaged material from the wrecked Grafton, built a cabin, developed techniques for harvesting seals for food and oil, tanned seal hides for clothing, and ultimately built a forge and furnace. Encouraged by Musgrave, the men banded together in a common quest for survival. They cooperated in procuring food, rotating duties and nursing each other. They shared duties of hunting and maintaining a fire. They even crafted a chess set and a card game for recreation and taught the illiterate sailors to read. They adapted to a new type of discipline, bonded by camaraderie developed from mutual respect and support. Finally, after 20 months of incredible survival, Captain Musgrave and his crew fashioned a small seaworthy dinghy and crossed the open ocean, needing to constantly pump seawater out of the leaky craft for days before they ultimately made it to civilization in New Zealand. In the meantime, at the other end of Auckland Island, Captain Dalgarno and the crew of the Invercald suffered the survived the wreck itself but chaos ensued. 
Attempts by Captain Delgarno and his officers to maintain the hierarchy and discipline of the ship failed. Witness testimony and diaries describe Delgarno trying to maintain the chain of command, requiring the sailors to forage for food for the officers and prioritizing his own privilege for shelter, sleeping arrangements, and sustenance. However, Captain Delgarno failed to inspire his men and was unable to maintain credibility, respect, or control. There was no camaraderie to bind them, and even the crisis before them did not provoke a common purpose or an ability to work together. Ultimately, only three survived to be rescued by a passing ship a year later. Six years ago, in my address to the Western Thoracic Surgical Association, I briefly outlined this same story. Yet six years ago, I simply concluded that Captain Musgrave displayed leadership and Captain Delgarno did not. But I have learned a lot, and over the past several years, I've realized that this difference is probably much more nuanced than the simple presence or absence of leadership. In fact, there is no evidence that Captain Delgarno was a weak or ineffective leader. On the contrary, Delgarno had a distinguished career and was a highly respected captain when he embarked on the expedition with the Invercald. The tragic outcome is more likely due to Captain Delgarno maintaining a leadership style that he was accustomed to and that had been successful throughout his career, yet did not pertain to a radically altered environment. A drastic change of circumstance required a similarly drastic change in leadership in order to rally his men to the camaraderie and commonality of purpose that was necessary for their survival. This was a randomized trial, a randomized trial on Auckland Island, and it becomes illustrative. In contrast to Delgarno, Captain Musgrave completely altered his leadership after the shipwreck. Musgrave flattened the hierarchy that had been important for structure and discipline on the ship and threw his lot in with his men, sharing even the most menial duties, leading by example rather than by command, and established respect and leadership amongst his men. Both of these men were faced with nearly identical challenges on the same island at the same time. One of these leaders failed in spite of a clear track record of successful leadership. He and his crew deteriorated into chaos and anarchy with the ultimate loss of human dignity and human life. However, the other inspired his team while enduring the same harsh conditions, maintaining a high standard of social structure and resulting in the survival of all of his crew. Changing times dictate the need for change in leadership style. Cardiothoracic surgeons are natural leaders who influence their teams, their departments and hospitals, their communities, and even public policy. Yet effective or acceptable leadership style has progressively changed significantly over the course of most of our careers. This change is not as sudden as a shipwreck, but it is no less profound. Although most of us have familiarity and proficiency with a hierarchical or authoritarian leadership style, similar to a captain on a ship, the world and environments that we face are almost always more responsive now to selfless leaders with integrity and emotional intelligence. These leaders motivate people with a shared vision of the future, and they communicate well. They also are typically self-aware authentic, empathetic, and humble, characteristics not routinely considered the strong suit of cardiothoracic surgeons. Leadership principles are common fodder for presidential addresses, and it is hard to contemplate covering new territory that has not been better considered or better presented by previous presidents. However, as I have considered these remarkable contrasts between the two captains stranded on Auckland Island, I see changes and challenges that require us to rethink our leadership style and principles. As cardiothoracic surgeons, we are accustomed to being the captain of our own ship, directing our surgical team in the operating room and our clinical team in the hospital. 
But in all aspects of our specialty, we are increasingly reliant on collaborative partnerships with other specialties and our allied healthcare colleagues. Although these collaborations have always been present, they have been changing so rapidly in the last few years that they have created a new paradigm for practice in nearly all areas of cardiothoracic surgery. As cardiothoracic surgeons, we like data. Data that informs what we do and validates our outcomes. Well, data exists for the preferred characteristics of leaders in the modern world and appear to parallel the successful transition to an adaptive and selfless leadership that helped Captain Musgrave be successful on Auckland Island. The social scientists John Gerzema and Michael Antonio recently surveyed 60,000 people in 25 countries that represented 65% of the world's gross domestic product. The authors identified 125 different human behavioral traits and were able to show that across age, gender, and culture, people around the world feel that feminine traits correlate strongly with making the world a better place, something that we all know about in our homes every day. They found that traditionally feminine attributes and values are now more strongly related to leadership than the macho paradigm of the past, and that people are frustrated by a wor world dominated by codes of male thinking and behavior, codes of control, aggression, and black and white thinking. Unfortunately, the modern preference for feminine values, characteristics, and leadership place our specialty of cardiothoracic surgery at a distinct disadvantage. It takes only a casual glance around the room to confirm that 95% of cardiothoracic surgeons are encumbered with the foibles of masculine leadership. Gerzema and Antonio have written a book outlining the impact of feminine traits on leadership. Fortunately, the authors parenthetically note that men who think like women can be successful leaders too. But we are burdened by the culture in which most of us were trained and by some of the masculine traits identified in Gerzema's work. Traits such as dominant, strong, ambitious, hardworking, assertive, and competitive. But also, unfortunately, such pejorative traits as arrogant, rigid, overbearing, and selfish. It might be easy to characterize this recent research by Gerzema and Antonio as an isolated and provocative effort to market books. However, there are some similar credible researchers in leadership theory that confirm the desirable principles of feminine leadership in our organizations today. The leadership consultants, Zanger Folkman, recently published a study of over 7,000 executives to middle management leaders published in the Harvard Business Review. As one might expect, men outnumbered women in senior leadership positions by nearly four to one. However, on a leadership effectiveness index, women scored definitively better than men. And out of 16 important traits of leadership, women scored higher in 12 of these 16 traits, including such traditionally masculine traits as taking initiative, driving for results, or establishing stretch goals. But just as importantly, feminine leadership traits identified by Gerzema and others were highly important in the study from Zenger Folkman, traits such as displaying high integrity, honesty, developing others, building relationships, and collaboration and teamwork. We have understood for many years the importance of increasing the number of women in cardiothoracic surgery, but this data provides further incentive for recognizing and promoting female leadership within our specialty. Advancing women within our specialty provides individuals with a set of leadership styles that are better suited to our current practice environments and to the culture and expectations of the millennium generation and those that follow. Women have a more natural tendency to be what are known as selfless leaders. That is, leaders who understand that the cornerstone of honorable leadership is to serve those that we lead. 
I encourage our program directors to look for ways to make our training programs and our practices more attractive to women. And I encourage our leaders in the specialty to look for opportunities to mentor, encourage, and promote the female cardiothoracic surgeons around them. It can only serve to make us better. The success of Captain Musgrave and the success of women leaders in the 21st century are linked by the principle of selfless leadership that is often ascribed to those individuals who we consider our greatest heroes. These selfless leaders are attuned to the concerns of their followers and empathize with them, making others better by their presence. Carolyn Reed was one of those remarkable people and leaders in our specialty. I feel privileged to have been counted as a friend and colleague and to have stood behind Carolyn in whatever she was doing. Carolyn was a pioneer who was the first woman chair of the American Board of Thoracic Surgery and the first woman president of one of our cardiothoracic societies. She was also the first woman president of this society, but never privileged to serve as her life was cut short by cancer. Carolyn was an example of the best that we can strive for as cardiothoracic surgeons in our daily practice and in the care of patients, as well as in education, mentorship, and leadership of the younger generation. Carolyn inspired and still inspires me, and we have all benefited from her selfless leadership. The characteristics of these selfless leaders emphasize trust, empathy, and the capacity to listen and to relate to others. More than ever before, leadership is about the expression of tolerance combined with integrity and confidence. It requires courage to be both vulnerable and connected to others, and it requires humility to accept codependency and an acknowledgement of one's own weaknesses and vulnerabilities. This modern or feminine style of leadership is not about competition. It is not about raising oneself up above the others around you, and certainly not by pulling down those around you. Modern leadership is about elevating the people around you, and perhaps people not even noticing that you were the reason. We're a competitive group, competitive with each other, competitive with ourselves, and this competition has served us well in sports and in accomplishments in our professional lives. In a masculine construct, winning is typically considered a zero-sum game. One wins, one loses. But in our environments of heart teams and multidisciplinary care, winning is plural. Sustainable improvements depend on collaboration and agreement. Over the longer time horizon, we will see that the real winners are those that invoke the skills of sharing credit and consensus building in order to achieve shared success. Our careers will ultimately be a reflection of our character, how we treat others, how we work with people, and the strength of our integrity. Even though it may not come naturally to hard-charging and high-achieving men that make up a majority of our specialty, Feminine traits that are admired today suggest that we would all benefit from diminishing our ego and striving more for modesty and kindness. Vulnerability can be our new strength. Instead of covering up failure and pointing fingers, openness and humility are gateways to improve relationships and opportunities, as well as ways of seeing the world in new ways that may be the most important part of change management. Colonel Eric Kale served as the course director for military leadership at West Point until his untimely death earlier this year from cancer. Colonel Kale identified six leadership characteristics and focused on those successful requirements for the modern leader. These are remarkably consistent with the feminine leadership characteristics identified by Gerzema and the Zenger Folkman researchers. When one considers the most influential people in your life, individuals who have had the greatest impact, what was it that made such a difference? Was it their skills, 
accomplishments or abilities that left such an impression, or was it their character? Kale suggests that it is character, not accomplishments, that is what makes an, an individual stand apart as an exceptional leader. He identifies courage, integrity, humility, selflessness, empathy, and collaboration as providing the foundation for that character. The role of courage is more about conviction to moral principles than taking risks in dangerous settings. In cardiothoracic surgery, we have tremendous examples of courage all around us. We have celebrated the founders of the society today who had the courage and vision to create a new specialty society. We recognize this courage today in those who expand the boundaries of traditional cardiothoracic surgery with endovascular, hybrid, and minimally invasive techniques and who have the courage and strength of character to share this with our allies, the cardiologists, in contrast to the self-protective turf battles from the past. We owe a debt of gratitude to the courage of STS leaders like former presidents Sid Levitsky and Ranny Chitwood and director of, at large, Joe Bavaria. We have a group of surgeons with military service here today who should inspire us with their daily courage. Courage not just in the face of injury or death, but courage to put their careers on hold and to leave their families in the service of our country and our injured soldiers. Cardiothoracic surgeons are the ultimate surgeon's surgeon. Trained in general surgery, specialized in the technical aspects of cardiovascular and thoracic surgery, and adept at caring for critically ill patients. The cardiothoracic surgeons who have served overseas have saved untold lives while they and their families have made enormous sacrifices. Of course, for every one of these surgeons, there is an individual story of service and leadership to inspire us. But I would like to choose just one because it is, it is illustrative of the everyday heroes, not just that serve in the military, but who fill this auditorium. Many of you know Cam Wright, who is a senior thoracic surgeon at Massachusetts General Hospital and a professor of surgery at Harvard. Cam is a soft-spoken, humble, and understated man in spite of his remarkable accomplishments as a surgeon, educator, and leader. Cam is not only a director at large for our society, but is also the vice chair of the American Board of Thoracic Surgery. Cam was at a comfortable stage of his career with no existing military commitment when he joined the Army Reserves in 2007. At the time, Cam's son was deployed and serving in the Marine Corps in Iraq. He knew that if his son was injured, he would want him to be cared for by the best possible surgeons. And in an act of remarkable courage and loyalty, he volunteered for service and has now been deployed three times to Iraq and Afghanistan in support of our troops. Cam, I have always admired you, but you set an example of courage and service to inspire us, courage to step out of the safety and comfort of your secure position at MGH in order to care for the soldiers who are serving our country. The second character of leadership that I would like to emphasize is the role of integrity. This may be the most critical character for our leaders because it builds valuable trust between people, a trust that is necessary to build credibility, confidence, and an acceptance by our teams. Being a person of integrity does not mean you have not committed a moral or ethical violation. It means that one has the humble introspection and strength of character to learn from these mistakes and seek continued self-improvement. It is remarkable that the term integrity becomes very highly charged, with individuals accused of either having integrity or not, as if it was an all-or-none phenomenon in contrast to nearly all other human characteristics. Yet integrity is an imperfect 
and incomplete quality like most others. It can be developed. It can be learned. It is something for us to strive for and improve rather than to declare present or absent. We recognize and respect integrity when we see it. Our goal should be to model those individuals and the traits that we respect. Many of us have individuals who serve as our moral compass or our, as our own examples of integrity that we aspire to. Those individuals for me are Doug Matheson and Carlos Pellegrini. Doug Matheson is a mentor and friend who provides the clearest example of anyone I know of the integrity and honesty of doing the right thing and doing it all of the time. I know that when I am faced with an issue of moral uncertainty that a conversation with Doug affords me much clarity and a greater confidence in making the right decision. Carlos Pellegrini is my boss, but he is more than a boss. He is a daily example of integrity and emotional intelligence in his dealing with people and his leadership of organizations. Carlos holds a depth of human understanding and strength of moral character that I can only aspire to. But aspire to, I do. For I have this outstanding pillar of integrity to model and to work beside every day. We should all be so lucky to work with and have colleagues like Doug and Carlos, and I would like to encourage each of us to seek out and imitate those people that we so admire. A third characteristic of the modern leader is humility, one of those female leadership traits that promote, promote respect, loyalty, and trust in our modern team environments. I think it is fair to say that humility has not been a primary characteristic of cardiothoracic surgeons. Our leaders have frequently been bold and brash, sometimes to epic proportions, providing terrific stories and anecdotes that are often recounted at meetings like this. The stories are humorous in their recounting of outsized egos, self-admiration, and the hero worship that accompanied the beginnings and rapid growth of our specialty. But I'm not criticizing our, our early leaders or the style that was effective and relevant at the time, but the specialty and the world have evolved. We work in a better established, safer, yet increasingly diverse and complex team environment. The expectations of our teams and the rules of engagement between people promote a softer and more collaborative style of, research, of authority the style modeled best by our women leaders and, by, and demonstrated by Captain Musgrave successfully as he navigated a radically changed leadership environment after a shipwreck on Auckland Island. Humility provides us with a clear perspective and respect for our place in context to others. It is that character that leads us to celebrate success in others more than in ourselves and the humble recognition that our own successes are due to the substantial and cumulative influence of the people around us. As many of you know, having seen for myself some of the remarkable contributions of cardiothoracic surgeons to their community and to their country, I solicited from our members stories about some of the remarkable surgeons and ways that they are working to make the world better. Receiving and reading these stories has been truly an inspiration to me and a validation of what I knew about the greatness of people within our specialty, the people who fill this room. Many of these stories demonstrate the humility of self and the service of others, but one that stands out and shows how any of us can positively influence our community relates to Dr. Jane Schwabe. She's a cardiothoracic surgeon in St. Joseph, Missouri. Jane is not only an outstanding surgeon like those of you in this room, but her influence reaches far beyond the operating room. Dr. Schwabe is the founder and physician champion of the Fourth Grade Challenge, an eight-week wellness program for children in Missouri. 
Recognizing that children at this age are learning to make choices that affect their entire lives, this program focuses on exercise, nutrition, and health that now has expanded to include all of the elementary schools in the city of St. Joseph's. Dr. Schwabe is particularly interested in reinforcing the dangers of smoking and has become a local celebrity, a celebrity amongst nine-year-olds and their parents. And this is her humble, quiet, and important influence on children's lives in her own community. A fourth characteristic of the successful modern leader is the role of selflessness. While selfish leaders often want their personal pride stroked by feeling important and intimidating others, these traits are old-fashioned and counterproductive. Selfless leaders manage to subvert their own egos in order to focus on the mission and those that can accomplish it. But this selflessness requires an enormous amount of self-confidence and character. Selflessness is all about strength. It takes heart and soul to lead with a seeming paradox of authority that is secondary to the needs and goals of the team. True selflessness requires courage, introspection, and humility to know that in serving and developing others, we do the most for quietly promoting ourselves. The philosopher Lao Tzu described it well, as for the best leaders, the people do not notice their existence. The next best, the people honor and praise. The next, people fear. And the next, the people hate. When the best leader's work is done, the people say, we did it ourselves. A remarkable and inspirational example of the selfless leader within our midst is Dr. Rafael Espada. When I sought nominations earlier this year for examples of remarkable surgeon leadership, Dr. Espada's enormous and altruistic contributions were com commented on by many. Most of you know Dr. Espada as an established and highly skilled cardiothoracic surgeon in Houston, but most of us may not be aware of the true extent of his influences. At the height of his career, Dr. Espada was asked to run for the Vice Presidency of Guatemala. Over his four years in office, he embraced the 34 indigent Mayan tribes whose advocacy had been ignored by previous administrations. He improved the health care of the neglected population and the population at large by launching a system of outpatient care centers and building a charity heart hospital in Guatemala, now the premier heart center in Central America. Dr. Espada has initiated and helps to lead a private foundation that provides education and health care for the rural Mayan children, and also initiated a preschool curriculum modeled on the Head Start programs in the United States. Dr. Espada's efforts have impacted the lives of millions of people within Central America. Obviously, most of us will not have the opportunity nor even the desire to change our practice to lead a small country. Yet Dr. Espada's selfless leadership transcends his position as Vice President of Guatemala and is an inspiration for all of us as, as we consider ways that we may make an impact in the world. The next characteristic of effective leadership is empathy, again an area where women traditionally outshine men. Empathy is a key component of what is commonly coined as emotional intelligence, that characteristic that helps us understand what another person is thinking or feeling, and a discernment and sensitivity to the emotions and perspective of others. Empathy involves making less of a distinction between oneself and others, and even requires the ability to imagine oneself as another person. This is a sophisticated imaginative process, the true form of walking in someone else's shoes. Empathy includes compassion or concern for another and the wish to see them better off and happier. When we truly consider and understand the position of the person we are dealing with, and when we trust that their motives are well-intended and sincere, 
it becomes easy to find a common position or the win-win situation that benefits all. Empathy and being more patient with others gives us the tools to be better leaders, better at conflict resolution and avoidance, and better role models for our trainees and for the other members of our team. One of the most important characteristics of the leader today is the ability to collaborate. Collaborators look to promote their team and organization by sharing ideas and resources with others for mutual benefit. This is in contrast to leaders who are protective and defensive of themselves or their organization and who view our profession as a field of competition rather than a field of partnership. For those with the long view, collaboration is fundamentally an opportunity rather than a threat. When we think about 50 years of STS history, we recognize that we stand on the shoulders of giants the founders of our society, the past presidents, and the other leaders who have made our society and the specialty what it is today. But what is important for us to realize is that we also serve alongside giants, and we work with giants in our field every day. They are in our operating rooms, they refer patients, and they serve on committees with us in our hospitals or in our specialty societies. They may be fellow cardiothoracic surgeons, or perhaps cardiologists, anesthesiologists, oncologists, or other members of our team. We have forged important and meaningful partnerships with cardiologists in the implementation of transcatheter valves and with evaluations of PCI and cabbage. Mike Mack, Jeff Rich, Robert Guyton, along with many others, have been important and selfless ambassadors who have championed the multidisciplinary management of heart disease and heart teams, rather than a competition between interventional cardiology and cardiac surgery. Outdated models of leadership may have endorsed beating the competition as the road to success. A more modern or enlightened view is that the success of those around us does not diminish us at all, and instead raises the boat for the whole group, including ourselves. Rather than competition, it, it is the view that we can all succeed together without the need for winners and losers, and that taking pride in the accomplishments and successes of others does not cost a thing, and it enhances rather than diminishes our own stature. I hope that you can take away from these words a few thoughts that will help cardiothoracic surgeons continue to take it to the limit for the next 50 years with the success we have shared in the last half century. I want us to celebrate who we are and what we do. I know that all of you take it to the limit with small acts of heroism and leadership every day. You are the leaders of your teams, the leaders in your hospitals, leaders in the community, and leaders in almost everything you do. I encourage you to lead like women, to lead with the traits that are valued today. And I encourage you to promote the women around you. Look for opportunities for our own female cardiothoracic surgeons to use the leadership skills that they have in our hospitals and in our societies. Encourage women to enter the specialty of cardiothoracic surgery. Demonstrate the excitement, innovation, and career value that we have as surgeons. Encourage them, because that is how we will grow, that is how we will stay relevant in the 21st century, and that is how all of us, women and men alike, will learn from each other how to take it to the limit for our specialty and for the world. Thank you for the privilege of being your president this past year. I'm humbled, fortunate, and gratified by the privilege to serve. I'm proud to count myself among you in this room and our colleagues covering the patients at home, the everyday heroes and leaders of cardiothoracic surgery. Let's take it to the limit one more time. Thank you.